Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm joined by his special guest. His name is The Wandering Investor. Also, and his real name is Ladislas Maurice. Uh, Ladislas, how's it going, man? Good, good. How about you, Vince? Doing well, chilling here in Guadalajara, Mexico. May I ask uh, where you're joining us from? I'm in Istanbul in Turkey right now. That's awesome. And so uh, for a little context to the listeners, uh, Ladislas, the wandering investor, has a pretty big presence on YouTube, Twitter, on his blog. And I've watched a bunch of his videos spanning from talking about getting residency and opening bank accounts in Panama to investing in real estate in Bogota and Medellin. Um, and so I, I like the fact that you're like an international investor. You're not 100% dedicated to any one country. Um, you know, you're interested in diversification. And uh, I, I continue to learn about all the international programs as well. This is the My Latin Life uh, podcast, but I think it's cool to hear about what's going on in Turkey or in Eastern Europe and things like that to sort of um, compare and contrast and and know how things stack up. So we'll do a little bit of that comparing and tr- contrasting in this episode, but I thought maybe you could uh, give a little bit of a personal introduction for our audience uh, about who you are and what you do. Sure, sure. So a bit of background. So college in Canada and then grad school in Australia. Then I worked for approximately seven years in corporate. So my last role, so actually I spent most of my 20s in Africa, working in Africa for Nestle, the big food company. So my last role there was being in charge of the dairy business for a few West African countries. And at the age of 30, I left and wandered off quite literally. So I started off with a big road trip, going from Oman in the Middle East to Paris by car, going through all of Iran, the Caucasus, Turkey, um, Eastern Europe. And, you know, when you work full time, you don't have enough time to think about things, to think about your money, to think about your investments. And generally, you end up making substandard decisions in many aspects of your life when you have a, you know, an eight to eight job. So on on this road trip, I just saw all these opportunities in these emerging markets. And I gradually started doing deals thinking, oh, I'll just get a job after this deal. I'll get a job after that deal. And then I I never got to get a good job. I just went from deal to deal. And then this is what I started doing full time, essentially traveling around the world and looking at investment opportunities, mostly in emerging and and frontier markets. So that's taken me a lot to the Middle East, to Eastern Europe, to the Balkans, to Africa, and now increasingly to Latin America as well. That's awesome, man. And I, I was trying to uh, scroll back a bit and see how long you've been doing this. You, you actually only started your YouTube channel maybe only one year ago, and you're already at like 15,000 subscribers, which is really significant in the first year. So I can see how you've definitely struck a nerve with people. And to be honest, there's just not that many people um, doing this type of stuff, talking about this type of stuff. Uh, I imagine you've been doing it a bit before YouTube, though. I mean, how did you kind of get started uh, in this world of, uh, I don't even know what you call this world, but you know, uh, offshoring, diversification, international investing, etc. Well, as as I was doing these deals for myself, I was, you know, I just randomly post pictures on on Facebook when it was still kind of partially cool, and my friends would be like, "Ladislas, like you're in all these weird countries, and you don't seem to have a job. What is it that you do?" And so I started a blog, like a written blog for fun, just writing a few articles here and there. And then it started taking off. Uh, people started getting in touch with me. I thought, oh, okay, that's that's an interesting thing. Like, it's I think I might have a little side business here. And um, and then I started a YouTube channel as well. So now I have both the blog and the YouTube channel. And um, it's something that I do part time to really help people with their interna- internationalization and diversification strategies. So like, so you're saying it kind of got started on Facebook and then you sort of saw that there was um, uh, a bit of a market or interest in it. Um, where do you help people the most? Is it 
consulting? Is it acting as like a, a real estate broker? So you're sharing a lot of different information, different places, things like that. Like, what does it sort of like funnel down to? Or what do you find people like need help with the most? Yeah, I do quite a bit of consulting. So people who, for example, are sitting in the US or sitting in, in Canada, and they want to not have all of their assets in their in their home country. They want to buy real estate overseas, but they're not sure which markets to invest in. Because I mean, you know, investing in Hungary or investing in Colombia are very different value propositions. And also a lot of these people want to obtain a second citizenship, a second residency, and they're not too sure where to start and which programs would uh, be appropriate for them. Definitely. And um, do you find like, and so when you help people with the consultancy, I know you have like an email list and everything. Um, How do you normally like structure it with people? Uh, Do they, you know, pay you know, is it sort of like a, a mentorship model or how do you like, how do you normally structure it? Yeah. I mean, it's um, well, one, it's none of it is, is considered formal advice because I'm not an investment, uh, a financial professional and typically in their country, their country of residence. Mm-hmm. So it starts off with just a 15 minute call where I try to understand people's objectives And then I think about it for a few days and then like a week later or so we have the actual call and then we go through all of the potential options that they have and as well as the pluses and minuses. And then we try to, to look really at their own personal objectives and what might be a better fit. Mm -hmm. Cause I know like there's a couple of these, uh, uh, platforms or companies like international living, live and invest overseas. You might be familiar with them. And they, they share a lot of information about retiring and stuff like that. And it seems like it ultimately filters down to trying to get people invest in like the real estate opportunities they have going on. And so like, do you, do you like get involved with the real estate deals with your clients, uh, in that sort of personalized way and you get like a cut somehow, or do you sort of just keep it to like consulting zoom calls, that kind of thing? So I, as I travel around, cause like, for example, when I went to, you know, Colombia, I was looking at real estate for myself as an investment. Mm-hmm. So I go and I meet a lot of different real estate agents. I meet a lot of different people. And as you know, like real estate agents, typically 80% of them talk a lot of crap. <laughs> so by spending time on the ground, I identify real estate agents that are better than average. And then I decide to collaborate with them to, you know, send potential clients their mm-hmm. way. Um, mm-hmm. typically I would get a small cut of their commission, but it doesn't, not always actually, um, but it doesn't impact the prices for the client. So if they go through me to that agent, it doesn't increase their cost in any way whatsoever. Um, so that's, that's how I operate. So essentially when people use my website for real estate services, they have a, a curated list of better than average real estate agents in mm-hmm a whole bunch of markets where I did on the ground research myself. So I didn't just call some guy and say, Hey, do you want to be my real estate agent? I was actually on the ground meeting many different people before I selected that person to work with. That's awesome. And that's valuable stuff because it can be pretty hard. I feel like most people's first intuition is either to look for Remax or like a brand name broker Or they'll go into Facebook groups and they'll look up, you know, the history of conversations in the groups, or they'll just make a post and kind of get hit with a bunch of spam. Like, Hey, we, you know, um, that being said, it is like a reasonably good place to find some, um, like what, what do you, what would you say are some of the best ways to find real estate agents? And then also like other service providers, IE immigration lawyers and whatnot, uh, when you're looking at a new country. Look, so my model is that when I'm, I go somewhere to look for immigration opportunities or investment opportunities, I take my time. I don't just go somewhere for three days and then, you know, reach a conclusion. I, I like to spend time on the ground. So I'd like to just walk around and walk into random real estate agencies, give them a brief, and then see what they come up with. 
because actually that's the best way because you can have all that fancy marketing online you know see these agents with amazing marketing but it doesn't mean they're any good sometimes you just have that one guy in an office you give him a brief he understands your brief and he's not talking crap and he's able to show you the stuff that you you should be looking into rather than trying to sell you the stuff that you know brings in a bigger commission or that's just easy and these people you generally find them by just you know walking the street really walking the street and walking into random agencies that's the ultimate that's test cool. giving them a brief and seeing what they come back with yep just go into a neighborhood that you like and you see the for rent for sale signs and start sending some yep. whatsapp messages exactly Exactly. And now with Google Translate, you can get a lot done if you don't speak the language locally. Awesome. And so what um, markets are you most excited about right now? Uh, I always thought the Turkey one was cool where you can get like instant citizenship by buying a property for 250K. I thought that one was pretty cool. Um, what are some of the international opportunities for, um, for I guess, residency permits and then also for just like pure, like good IRR returns that you're seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you say, Turkey is absolutely, is an amazing deal. Um, you buy for, like you said, you buy any mix of real estate for $250,000. So it, it, can't, it doesn't have to be just one apartment. It can be a combination of three apartments that get you to the mark of $250,000 anywhere in the country. And it's a big country with a lot mountains skiing um the the mediterranean sea istanbul you know one of the world's foremost historical capitals and you just buy that and then nine months later you your spouse and your children under the age of 18 become Turkish citizens and then that's like a legacy once your kids are citizens you know your grandchildren will be citizens too they'll be turkish citizens as well so you just by making that small investment in Turkey, you've just created something that's that is very gener like multi generational that'll just pass it down because that crazy mm -hmm. grandfather made that investment you know 150 mm -hmm. years ago. Now <laughs> all the descendants are Turkish, so I, I find that very very appealing, and that passport gives you access. Look. We, so I, I'm assuming a lot of your target, a lot of your audience is, is Western, so probably North American. The reality is that with Western passports, increasingly people don't necessarily like us that much because of a history of rather aggressive foreign policy. And, and Canadians are not excluded from this anymore. Canadians think they're excluded when they, they're proud to put their Canadian flag. But the reality is the rest of the world now sees Canada as pretty much the U.S. in terms of foreign policy. So when you go around with a Western passport, people don't always think very positively of you. But if you travel in a lot of these developing countries, if you travel around Africa, or if you go into Latin America with a Turkish passport, people would tend to view you differently. Because you're part of also, you're an emerging market, you, Turkey hasn't caused any issues in Latin America, etc. So people tend to view you differently and it provides you with access to, to countries where potentially in the future we as Westerners will not have access to. So it would appear that we're increasingly entering a world that is going to be multipolar with different spheres of influence. We saw what mm -hmm. happened to Russians. Suddenly they get canceled. They can't go to Europe anymore. They have problems. They can't use their bank cards, etc. And the same thing could happen to us in other countries. So 100%. having a, a passport that is potentially in the future going to be more aligned with the other side, whether you agree with the other side or not, that's not the debate. The point here is, is access and having options will potentially down the line bring you extra benefits as well as potential exposure to, to risks. But that's a personal decision to make. Like, for example, if you want to go to Iran as a Westerner, you need to apply for a visa, et cetera. It's not necessarily that easy. But as a Turkish citizen, you can just enter Iran visa-free, travel around Iran. 
definitely. Um, and then other <laughs> markets. So that's Turkey. Generally, in terms of markets that are interesting, look, it from a lifestyle point of view, Latin America, great. Uh, then there's also Eastern Europe and, and kind of the Balkans. So I see a lot of Americans who want to move to places like Montenegro, like Serbia, etc., cetera, uh, where generally if you buy real estate, you can get a residency permit. But what I'm increasingly seeing in the, amongst also my European audience is because of tensions in Europe. People, Europeans are now thinking of Latin America again, which they were not for quite a while. But if, if you look at it historically, if you look at European history, every 50 years or so, there is a period of a few years where as a European, you would be better off being in Latin, chilling in Latin America for a few years until things just kind of calm down. And maybe we are entering one of those periods, or at least I see it in, in, the, in the number of referrals to, to Latin America and uh, the discussions I have with European clients, people are starting to think that maybe now is the time to go spend a few years in Latin America away from all the geopolitical tensions because the tensions are very real. There's a very real war. There's a lot of war mongering. So it's not just a war. There's a war mongering people in Western countries pushing for more war. Uh, the Russians are not going to back down. And things could potentially escalate. And if they do escalate, you're probably better off, you know, sipping a Corona in Mexico than being in Berlin. No, no definitely. And, and thanks, because it's a great segue. And it's a really interesting point that you're making. You know, historically, uh, within the digital nomad sphere of things, um, North American digital nomads would go to Latin America and European digital nomads would go to Eastern Europe and Asia, right? Um, partly from a time zone perspective, uh, ease of access perspective. And typically like Europeans have been somewhat underrepresented in Latin America. Like sure, there's some German guys running around the hostels and, and, and you know, whatever, things like that. But it, it's nothing compared to the Canadians and, and Americans. Um, but that being said, like, it does make sense to diversify into Latin America uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's really, really easy. Uh, two, like there, there's so many jurisdictions to choose from. There's so many countries in Latin America, and there's a lot of um, a lot of good territorial tax systems in Latin America. So if Dubai doesn't work for you, um, or you know the couple of the Middle East European ones. Latin America really makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And that's uh, that's why I like following you on Twitter as well, uh, because you always have these interesting snippets of, of, you know, insight on the ground in terms of tax stuff and so and, and all that and residency mm -hmm. schemes and, and all that. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's there's so many options, like literally every Latin American country has so many options to be able to immigrate and live there with pretty low thresholds too. Yeah. And thanks for shouting out the Twitter. Uh, anyone listening, our Twitter account is at my Latin life. So please uh, check that out. Um, yeah. So let's talk a bit about Latin America and the Americas. I mean, so you're, you're, uh, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, but you're, uh, you're French or a French citizen. Um, and you studied in Canada for university. Uh, yeah. you went to Bishop, you went to Bishop's university, which is in Quebec, like near the border, I think a historically English speaking university in a, in a very deep Quebecois part of uh, the country. Uh, <laughs> must've been a, but I mean, you spoke French, so it's all good. Must've been a, a good time. A lot of beer. <laughs> Beaucoup de beer. <laughs> Beaucoup de beer. Yeah. A lot of beer. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and so that, that kind of uh, introduced you to the Americas and, and our time zone early on. And then when did you start thinking about Latin America as a place that you wanted to uh, check out, invest in, and where did you go first? 
Yeah, so look, I have a lot of, um, I've traditionally had a lot of exposure to Africa, to the Middle East, to Western, Eastern Europe, a bit in America as well, Canada, in terms of my portfolio, a bit of Asia, but I, I never had that much exposure in terms of Latin America. So I started mm -hmm. traveling around to see if, if there are any real estate opportunities for me to, you know, diversify. Um, and also I want to start planting some, some serious flags in terms of residencies, permanent residencies, et cetera. So my thinking just came from a pure, and that was before the whole situation before COVID and all that, but it mm -hmm. was based on your pure diversification. I wanted to have a flag in that part of the world. I wanted to have some exposure. And I think with everything that's happening, as a European that spends a lot of time in Europe, Latin America has become a lot more attractive. Definitely. Definitely. And so I know that you're uh, particularly familiar with Panama, Colombia, and Nicaragua. Um, I'm pretty familiar with Panama. Uh, I'm a little less familiar with Colombia, but it's something that I'm looking into. And I uh, Nicaragua is actually one of the big ones I want to look into because it seems pretty easy to do and it's a territorial tax system and um, you don't need to buy property. It seems if you just have like an income, income stream, you could get in through that for a residency permit. Uh, I don't know. Like what, what's uh, talk to me a bit about uh, what you've done in Nicaragua. Have you, have you been there? Have you gone surfing in San Juan del Sur? Have you looked into <laughs> opportunities? <laughs> I, I mean, I got there just as COVID struck. So the rest of the world was in complete lockdown. And I spent um, three months just, you know, traveling around Nicaragua. And the place, the country was open. Essentially, the, the government just said, um, look, we're too poor a country. We can't lock down. So we're not going to put any restrictions. I mean, there were still nightclubs that were active and, and bars and stuff during the peak, peak of COVID. And mm -hmm. the government just said, look, we're too poor. We can't lock down. So people just, you know, take your own precautions. And it's just at this point, it's just a matter of personal decision in terms of what you want to do. If you want to close your business and et cetera, wear a mask, not wear a mask. Um, so being able to spend three months in essentially complete freedom was very nice. So from that point of view, I really enjoyed Nicaragua. I came back mm -hmm. to Europe and everyone was traumatized from months of lockdowns and I came back with a nice tan. I was like, oh, yeah, like I went to carnival, this and that. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. So I had a great time in Nicaragua. So I will always <laughs> promote Nicaragua as uh -huh. a nice country to spend time in. It's beautiful. It's pretty relaxed. You're right from a tax point of view. It's great territorial tax system. Many ways to get um, residency in Nicaragua. There is a rentista visa. There is a... Uh, there's also the one for retired people. If you yep. buy a property worth at least $30,000 and put it in a local Nicaraguan company, that also qualifies you for residency, you and your family. Uh, so there are many ways to get in. And life is fairly affordable and very relaxed. And uh, oh, it's sweet. It's Look, I, Costa Rica may be prettier, uh, but it's just incredibly expensive. Nicaragua is just great value for money. Um, you know, you don't have to be th this question. I know you can't fully, fully answer, but how many like passports and residencies do you have? I, I have a number of, of things. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk too much about that, but yeah, I have, and I'm working on a few. I'm uh, later this year, I'm going to go grab one or two residencies in, uh, actually my H2 is going to be dedicated to Latin America. Um, so I'll spend a few months in Mexico. I'll probably get myself permanent residency there, and then I'll go get one in South America as well, permanent residency there. Okay. And so what Latin American countries are on your radar um, uh, other than Mexico? Because we talk a lot about Mexico uh, at My Latin Life. Um, what, are, what are some of the other ones? Look, I mean, Colombia from a real estate point of view is – very interesting, um, specifically Medellin. So I looked into Bogota, very uninteresting market. 
Medellin has some very high rental yields. If you target the, the digital nomad market, people that mm-hmm. stay there between one and three months and you rent and you get an, you get an apartment, you renovate it, you know, nice renovation targeting North Americans, uh, you can get returns of 10% a year net eight to 10%, which is hard to beat anywhere else in the world. And you'd still have a property that would be available to you for personal use. And if you invest at least $155,000 roughly in real estate in Colombia, that gets you an investor visa. Um, you just the need to temporary. Sh- uh, no, no, like actual full residency. So I think and I heard it was like 150 for a temp residency permit and like 250 for permanent residency. No, 155 for per. Okay. Wait. And so sorry. how easy is sorry, it? Sorry, I need to, I need to plug my my laptop. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yo. Cool. And so talking about Medellin, um, I I've also thought it'd be an interesting opportunity as well. And what I noticed about your YouTube videos is you actually provide a lot of value going into sort of the minutia and the details around, um, okay, what's the HOA fee? Who pays the HOA fee? What happens if the faucet breaks? Things like that. And those are actually like really important details. Um, in Medellin, like how easy is it to get set up for Airbnb? Like, do you need to get um, an Airbnb permit or can you just put it right up? Like, what are some of the other uh, gotchas that you've that you've learned about along the way? That's a very good point. So very good question. So Airbnb is actually complicated in, in Colombia. Short term rentals, less than 30 days, you need the approval of the HOA to be able to do it. So in the vast majority of cases, the HOA will say no, because no one wants an Airbnb in their in their building. So the mm-hmm. only way to be able to do Airbnb on a short-term basis, less than 30 days, is to either buy an apartment in a building that was essentially built for Airbnb, where it's in the rules from day one, this is gonna be for short-term rentals, Mm -hmm. or to buy an individual house. If you buy in a normal building in Medellin, where there are normal people living, then you can only rent midterm, so long-term, and long-term in Colombia is at least 30 days. So it means there you have to target, you know, digital nomads coming for a month, two months, three months. Okay. And now, are you always, uh, sorry, I'll let you finish your thought. And, and to your point, why I ask all of these questions in my videos, et cetera, it's because I'm an investor myself. So I'm, I'm doing my, when I'm asking these questions, it's me doing my own market research for, for myself. So Columbia I like it a lot because of that mix of high rental yields and a really cool residency visa, which can turn into citizenship after a number of years, actually, without having to spend half the year in the country. So it's possible to buy real estate in Colombia, get very good yields, spend a few months every year in Colombia without becoming a tax resident in Colombia. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. after five years or so, apply for citizenship and then you, you actually have fairly good odds of obtaining citizenship if you spent a few months every year in Colombia and demonstrated some links as well to the country that you got involved and stuff etc so that that's really cool but i before investing in Colombia i'd wait for the presidential elections because if that petro communist guy comes to power um that wouldn't be very bullish Mm-hmm. No, I, I think the point you just made is literally for some people, what could be a life changing point, which is really the best, best case scenario for uh, residency to citizenship options is when you can like the best situation is when you can spend less than six months a year in the place and you're still citizenship track because a lot of places, yes, you can get residency, but if you're not spending significant time on the ground, uh, it's called a physical presence requirement, then it doesn't really put you on citizenship track. Um, and I have heard anecdotally in Mexico and in Colombia that if you're spending less than six months, you can still be citizenship track. So it's really great to hear that you've collected similar anecdotes. 
One thing I definitely wanted to mention to you, I don't know if uh, you, you kind of remind me a lot of Jim Rogers, the adventure capitalist. I don't know if he ever like inspired you early on. Um, I listen to him sometimes, but I, I, I don't know. I see him on like YouTube stuff sometimes. Good man. Uh-huh. Seems, seems good. Thank you. <laughs> He's like the older guy, right? He broke some world records uh, traveling around the world on a motorcycle and, and driving and spent a lot of time in Africa and just had like an international investing perspective. And in his books, what he would do is um, – he would just, he'd be in Africa or whatever, and he would just drive up to the stock market building and be like, hey, like, can I like invest 5K in the stock market and just like see how it goes? And he would t- tell stories about doing this in like Botswana or like random African markets. And so he was like one of the, like the original like frontier market investors and kind of did it in like a, like a fun folksy way as well. That's cool. Yeah. I, I wish I was that cool, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like there's one where he's in China in like the 80s. He's like one of the first Westerners to ever go. And he just like walks up. It's like the the stock market building is just like a nondescript. He just walks up and he's like, hey, like, can I invest? <laughs> and and like, can I just buy like a basket of all the stocks? And, you know, he's like fumbling with the language. It's good. <laughs> um, okay, so... One one quick question. So Nomad Capitalist talks a lot about the Eastern European um, programs and uh, how like Montenegro, Serbia, Albania, things like that. Um, I, I, I get the appeal for uh, European citizens potentially um, or for people or also for people that kind of want to be in Europe but don't have access to the EU. Like how do you make the case for uh, these Eastern European countries for investing there, getting residency there for, let's say, a North American? How, what, what would you what would you say to that person? Cool. So investing in residency are, are two different topics. I'd say from mm-hmm. a residency point of view, if you want to live in Europe, but without the whole kind of European Union bureaucracy, et cetera, and live, essentially live in Europe like it was maybe 20 years ago, where things are a bit more, where you have a bit more freedom, where people are a little bit more rough and where it's very European, you don't really see any non-Europeans around, et cetera. If you just want that very, very European vibe, then Eastern Europe is the only place to go nowadays. So it's, it's, you know, you can't compare a, like I rarely see any clients hesitating between, oh, should I move to Colombia or, oh, should I move to Serbia? It's, you know, it's comes down to what are you into? (laughs) You know, what are you into? No, that's fair. And I I, I have always really enjoyed people that had that international perspective and could kind of compare and contrast uh, the different regions because I thought it just gives you sort of like a wider perspective. Um, And so if you had to compare Latin America to Eastern Europe, um, just in a general way across, you know, a bunch of different metrics. Like, how do you think about like Latin America versus Eastern Europe versus Africa? What's the appeal of, <laughs> of Latin America to you? Oh gosh, we're going to have to go into generalization, generalizations. <laughs> That's dangerous territory. <laughs> cool. I mean, look, Latin America is, it's a lot of fun. Um, good weather. I mean, it's, I'm really generalizing here. Um, and people are pretty easygoing. As soon as you go into Eastern Europe, you're not going to see a lot of smiles on people unless they've been drinking. People can be a bit more, like, just rough, you know. Like, they just they won't be nice to you for no reason. Um, but you, you have probably a bit more history. Um, the education levels of people around you are probably a bit higher on average than they are in Latin America. So intellectually, it's, it's, you know, you have different conversations with people in Europe than you do in Latin America. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, what are you personally interested in? You know, if, if you like dancing, you don't go to Eastern Europe, you know, unless you're into techno. Um, <laughs> but you're not going to, it's not like lively like it is in, in Latin America. Makes sense. And as someone that's done business and invested in Africa uh, pretty extensively, 
I, I guess that must have prepared you pretty well for Latin America, prepared you for kind of the bureaucracy and a couple of things. Do you see similarities between the region? Do you find Latin America, uh, hopefully a little bit easier to deal with overall? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a breeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Latin America is a breeze next to Africa for sure. <laughs> well, you got good training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool, man. Um, yeah, so I, I know you wanted to get wrapping up. I mean, I think there's, you know, going to be a lot of opportunity for us to work together in the future. Um, a lot of my audience is really, really interested in, in doing this stuff in Latin America and in other regions in the world. And I love talking to people like yourself who, um, who, who are doing this stuff. I find it super, super interesting. Like I said, you know, I read that Jim Rogers book when I was like in high school and it super, super inspired me that along with like four hour work week and a couple others and really sort of put me on this path of, um, internationalizing myself. And, um, I hope it inspires our, our audience to do the same. And of course they can reach out to yourself or myself, uh, to, you know, for, for help with, uh, with, with their goals. So, um, yeah, I guess at this point in time, if you'd like to sort of, uh, tell people how they can get in contact with you or work with you personally. Great. Thank you, Vance. So I have a blog, uh, thewanderinginvestor.com. So I really encourage people to sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. So you'll get updates as I travel around the world. You'll get updates on investment opportunities. I see uh, market analysis and um, immigration opportunities. And then I also have, I'm also on Instagram, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Awesome, man. Well, this was a really, really great conversation. Uh, I enjoyed hearing about uh, the wanderings around the world and, and especially the investing. So thanks for joining us today on another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Cheers. <laughs>